uh, today in the distinguished lectures of the Josep Carreras Institute uh, of Research in Le Leukemia. We have a special treat. We will, our seminar is usually on Friday, but today we have a special treat because we have with us Dr. Henry Rodriguez. He is the, the founding director of the Office of Cancer Clinical Proteomics Research at the National uh, Cancer Institute, NCI, at the NIH in, in, uh, in the States. He is also a member of NCI's senior leadership. He has a background as a cell molecular biologist, also with a, a, some business orientation there. And he has been studying for many years the mechanisms of cancer in basic and clinical science and the development of technologies associated with this. Uh, he's a member of several organizations, uh, received many, uh, many honors, author of more than 140 uh, original articles. His original training came from Miami Dade Community College, Florida International University, with a PhD in the Boston University, and an MBA at Johns Hopkins in the States, and with his and fellowships, uh, Times, in the Scripps, and the City of Hope, also in the US. So, in addition to his uh, current role, he was also previously uh, acting as Deputy Director of the Center for the Strategic Scientific Initiative of the NCI. And he was also a liaison for many of the of the of these uh, studies uh, between um, between uh, NCI and and the Congress, I would say, and, and, and the government. So, but he's here to really to explain his expertise in in proteomics and to and to make us uh, understand how this omics, maybe that is not so popular in for molecular biologists, why this omics can be relevant in in cancer precision medicine. Remember, you can ask questions using the, the chat here. Uh, Henry, the, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Manel. And then welcome, everyone. It's actually a great honor to be given this presentation. And what I've been asked to do is to sort of give an overview of sort of a direction that we're now starting to take here at the National Cancer Institute. More specifically, it's in the space of precision oncology, but it's this idea that can we be in a position now to combine the information that has come out of the genomics landscape and then begin to functionalize that space, specifically at the protein level. So the title of my presentation accordingly is A New Horizon in Precision Oncology, one that I'm passionate about. And specifically, it's what I refer to as proteogenomics. So many of us in the research and the patient care community we really associate the word precision oncology with the discipline of genomics. And this is actually not surprising because as today we recognize that cancer is ultimately a disease of the genome. And this is evident through the many strides that have been made using genomics to understand and treat the many diseases of cancer. And this approach or philosophy, I'd say, in a way traces its roots to the early successes in therapeutics that ushered in the age of precision oncology driven medicine. So the very first one that sort of kicked off this world is Herceptin. So there's a monoclonal antibody that is used for the treatment of newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer in women that are positive for the HER2 receptor. And this was approved by the FDA in 1998 here within the United States. And then just a short time later, Gleevec, which is a kinase inhibitor, and it's used for the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia in patients that harbor a bcr aba one chromosomal translocation. And that, in turn, was approved in 2001. Oops, let me do a little bit here. It looks like this is in the way. And there you go. And then from those early breakthroughs to today, therapies that are used in clinical practice, cancer patients, the reality is, is that they're benefiting from a very diverse array of therapeutic target genomic features, such as somatic aberrations, which is what our targeted therapies go after. And this includes things such as amplification, gain of function mutations, as well as germline loss of function mutation, and today, that targets at least 11 different genes arising in now 10 different cancer types. And if we were to extend this list to the space of what we call research precision oncology, well, there, there are now more than 30 promising genes 
with clinical evidence supporting them as potential targets now for drug development. And let me just quickly adjust this little slide deck a little bit, because it seems that there's a little bit of shaving going on. Let me do this. And now it's way better. Okay. So with all that great information, with all that great sort of um, you know, bravery that I've talked about, about precision oncology, I'm going to make a statement. And that is, I'm going to argue that I think that we need to pivot back to the basics. Specifically, what I believe is that there is a disconnect from our ability to be able to connect the biology of cancer ultimately and translate it towards patient care. But I see that as an opportunity, and that opportunity for me is that is there a way now that we could develop novel approaches to better understand how to connect the genotype ultimately to the phenotype of an individual. And here's why I'm gonna make that argument. I'm gonna make this from the case of two perspectives. One's gonna going to be from a biological perspective and trying to look at it from a genomics perspective. And then I'm gonna look at it from a patient treatment clinical oncology perspective. So from a genomics perspective or genomics biology, I think the program that has set the bar and a lot of people are gonna be familiar with has to be the NCI's Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA. And that's a program that in a span of 10 years did a remarkable aspect in terms of us trying to understand the molecular characterization of cancer itself. So in 10 years, they basically uh, cataloged all the unique features in looking at tumors from just over 20,000 individuals. In that, they covered just over 30 tumor types. In the process, as I said, they identified a lot of interesting observations came out of it. But one of the unique things that came out of it is that they were able to identify all these actionable mutations, specifically where today we have therapies that are targeting a lot of those mutations. And more specifically, this is the world that is driving a lot of our clinical oncology clinical trials. So that's the good news. But now we have at least 10 years that a lot of this precision oncology is ongoing and we begin to look back on what is actually transpiring to a lot of our patients. And more specifically, what we're learning now over time is that it turns out a lot of those tumors from those individuals that we identified all these actionable mutations, many of them actually do not respond to the targeted therapy. And if they do respond, we're finding out that those responses are actually going to be now temporary lived. Either the individual develops a toxicity up front, or they're going to relapse with a short window or a couple of months or just a year or two later. Why? We have no idea why. But what I would argue that we do know with absolute certainty is that there is a tremendous amount of missing biology that we need to better understand. So now let's look at it from a clinical oncology perspective. So there was a very interesting paper that came out just a couple of years ago from a colleague of mine named Tito Fojo that used to be at the Cancer Institute, and now he's at Columbia University Medical Center. And what Tito did was sort of straightforward. He said, look, if we were to look at the FDA and ask how many compounds or therapies have been approved under that umbrella of precision oncology, and he scanned a period of 12 years within this one study. And for all those therapies that have been approved against all the cancer types that they target, if I were to exclude those exceptional responders, on average, two clinical endpoints I wish to learn about. And that's gonna be progression-free survival or overall survival. And to his surprise, and quite frankly, to the surprise of many, what we gained from that observation was that in, in reality, progression-free survival or overall survival was no better than three months. So what now we've been doing here at the Cancer Institute is that it got many of us to think, how can we now begin to improve on precision oncology specifically, hopefully try to make it more precise? So while we recognize that precision oncology, the reality is it would not exist without the human genome and the major significant accomplishments of the Cancer Genome Atlas or TCGA, today there is an acknowledgement 
that genomic characterization or analysis alone does not always provide sufficient insights into the molecular classification of cancer. I mean, the reality is, is that genomics and proteomics, they're not competitors, rather they're really partners. And at the Cancer Institute, we see the utilization, the discipline of both these two omics now as a team sport. So together, this multi-omic based approach, the one that we now call proteogenomics, we believe that it begins to hold the promise, to begin to reveal new molecular patterns of cancer biology with the potential, that's the key, with the potential to begin to inform new approaches either to cancer diagnostics and therapeutics. And at the Cancer Institute, the program that actually leads this activity is one that they refer to as CPTAC. So CPTAC, which stands for the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, this is actually a program that started in 2006. And the goal back then was straightforward. And that was to standardize proteomic methods to be able to ensure rigor and reproducibility when it comes to large-scale protein measurements among laboratories. And this was done, quite interesting, when we launched the initiative in coordination both with the United States Food and Drug Administration and with the American Association for Clinical Chemistry. Now, once we achieved this goal, what CPTEC did as a program, when it got reissued, it then applied its standardized proteomic workflows to previously genomically characterized tumor types from TCGA, specifically three tumor types, and we deemed it as a pilot. But what that pilot revealed is that ultimately it showed that additional layers of molecular information or the classification, a lot of it is simply not possible through genomics alone. So we revealed new interesting biology. And the success of that pilot of those activities ultimately led the National Cancer Institute then in 2016 to begin to expand CPTAC's proteogenomics tumor characterization program. And then for the very first time, which is the part that I've been very excited about, to begin to partner with NCI-supported clinical trials. So how does the structure actually look like? So here you go. On the left-hand side is the nice cartoon that I referred to now as the CPTAC neighborhood. But the right-hand side basically shows the activities. And that is, so CPTAC actually achieves two goals through those two connected activities. One, we have what's known as a tumor characterization program. So here we have what's known as uh, proteome characterization centers. They along with proteogenomic data analysis centers. So they're gonna work together. And what they do is they generate, they integrate, and ultimately they're gonna analyze proteogenomic data. And this program, everything is gonna come from prospectively collected cases that now will consist of a treatment of tumor along with its normal adjacent tissue. And these have been collected in an optimized SOP that we developed that ensures those materials now could best serve characterization both at the proteomic and at the genomic level. Then we have a translational research program. Here we have what we refer to as proteogenomic translational research centers. They along with those data analysis centers, so they're actually going to work together. And what they do is they're going to support clinically relevant research projects that subsequently use human specimens from our clinical trials. And these programs are address mechanisms of either treatment response, resistance, or toxicity. So the program was created in 2016. So what has CPTEC now as a program accomplished in the past couple of years? So responsible to characterize five tumor types in five years, the tumor characterization program has now comprehensively characterized a total of 10 tumor types in four and a half years. And in addition, our investigators are on track to characterize an additional two tumor types by the end of next calendar year. And as you can see, the program, I mean, the reality is we've been very fortunate and we've been very successful. And these represent our key flagship studies and that they've been published in high impact journals. And I'm not gonna go through each of the details, but you could actually search each of those papers to get all the specifics. But let's take a look at the translational research program. So here, the current focus is on three. One is gonna be on the use of proteogenomics to complement 
or better predict drug sensitivity. This one happens to be in acute myeloid leukemia. There's a second one that focuses on the development of prognostic markers of HER2 positive breast cancer. And there's a third that's gonna focus on the development of predictive markers for the diagnosis of platinum resistance, in this case, in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And without going into all the details within this slide, the good news is that the preclinical studies for all of these three cancer types have produced very interesting findings, which already has enabled both the AML and breast cancer studies to be approved for access to specimens from our clinical trials. And the ovarian cancer study is now preparing its paperwork to, sub to be submitted accordingly. But in addition, our Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center translational site, in the meantime, has established what we believe, now believe to be the very first CLIA laboratory for targeted mass spec proteomic based assays. So HER2 was the first CLIA certified assay within that lab. And what's quite nice is that we have a lot more that's in the queue. For example, we have a targeted panel that's being developed specifically for the field of immuno-oncology. So let's take a little deep dive into one of these studies, specifically at the HER2 positive breast cancer study. So one of the first things that this team had to do was to develop a microscale technique to be able to conduct comprehensive proteogenomic analysis, in this case now, from single needle core biopsies, of which ultimately they demonstrated that application using breast uh, uh, tumors from xenograft models. Now, once they were able to demonstrate the rigor and reproducibility of that analytical technique, then they performed a pilot study. And this was done using fresh frozen core needle biopsies from 50 patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. Now the sample accrual actually took place in this study before and after HER2 targeted therapy, and specifically after was 48 to 72 hours. But the results were quite interesting because they ultimately showed a reduction of HER2 phosphorylation post-treatment in the tumors that actually responded to the treatment therapy. While there was no corresponding reduction in those tumors which did not respond to the treatment. And for the tumors that did not respond to the treatment, well, the team then was able to identify diverse resistant mechanisms to the HER2 directed therapeutics in that trial that potentially now could be addressed with alternative approaches. So ultimately, because of these promising outcomes within this one group, they've now been approved for fresh frozen in this case because they're looking at modifications fresh frozen breast tumor core biopsies from HER2 positive patients in a randomized phase three clinical trial. And ultimately, quite frankly, I think what's quite nice about this study is that it begins to bring the potential of proteogenomics into clinical trials. In this case, because it's a breast cancer study, to stratify HER2 positive patients that have been diagnosed with breast cancer and possibly identify new adjuvant therapies. So one of the unique features or mandate, I'd say, of the CPTAC program is that the information that we produce, ultimately all of it gets placed in the public domain as a public resource. So what we refer to this unique feature is a data warehouse. So all of our outputs, to be very clear, we make them available to the public. Our proteomics data, we deposit it in what we created for the NCI. It's referred to as now the proteomic data commons. Our genomics data, we deposit that within NCI's genomic data commons. And our medical images, that includes uh, images from the pathology suite and also all the, all, all the radiological images, that ultimately gets deposited in the cancer imaging archive, which ultimately now is going to become NCI's imaging data commons. I'm not going to cite each of these statistics, but the part that I hopefully you can see from this one slide is that the demand, the use, of CPTEX data by the public domestically, especially on an international scale, far exceeds the amount of content that has been released by the program to date. And in addition to data, as I said, we have resources, and those resources come in two flavors. One are the dedicated assays that we're developing within our program. So all the protocols, all the SOPs, we will release it to the public. And all that information is located on CPTAX assay portal. And it's quite nice because to date, now we have over 2,500 fit for purpose proteomic assays that now are available to the public. 
where all the characterization guidelines, which is quite interesting, all those guidelines were developed. We did it in coordination with the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States and the American Association for Clinical Chemistry. And furthermore, that portal receives on average now 7,000 users per month. Some of these assays, they do require a higher level of sensitivity to be able to measure those proteins or uh, the measurement at endogenous levels. And to do that, we develop monoclonal antibodies. So not surprisingly, the other resources are gonna be monoclonal antibodies that are highly characterized through our program. And again, what's quite nice about this is to date, we've now produced over 750 monoclonal antibodies of which almost 5,000 of them have been sold around the world through a series of public-private uh, partnerships that we have with various distribution channels. So what about the argument, while well, you're developing a lot of research, is this research being translated into the clinical market? Well, in our ability to be able to translate at least our applications, because science does take time to move it towards patient care, but your applications, you could actually expedite that process. So our ability to translate those technologies to clinical diagnostics, actually CPTAC, uh, several years ago, we collaborated with clinical reference laboratories. And the partnership there was to develop and implement a targeted mass spec proteomic assay that in this case would circumvent the interference of autoantibodies. Specifically, this CLIA compliant assay is for the accurate measurement of serum thyroglobulin in patients with known or suspected antithyroglobulin autoantibodies. And this assay actually has now replaced traditional immunoassays used for the quantification of thyroglobulin levels in patient samples and is now being offered in six clinical reference laboratories here in North America. And if some of those or some of the new assays that we were developed would or were to require FDA approval, in other words, move from a laboratory developed test, which is what our thyroglobulin test is, to one that is going to require FDA approval, while well, as a program, we actually coordinate all of our activities with the FDA and clinical reference or clinical laboratory standards organizations, such as the CLSI here in the United States. And in fact, one of the things that we're currently working on is developing a consensus guidance document on the measurement of peptides using a mass spectrometer. And another very nice partnership, a public-private partnership that we did is to facilitate drug development. So in that capability, a nice collaboration actually took place about two years ago. And in this study, the reason it's interesting is because AstraZeneca was investigating two, in this case, they had ATP competitive inhibitors uh, that were focused on the ataxia pathway. And of course, that's associated with DNA damage uh, repair. So collaborating in this case with our Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center, a fit for purpose targeted mass spec assay panel ultimately got developed. And that was used to guide the selection of a clinically relevant pharmacodynamic biomarker for examining the ataxia signaling pathways, ATM and ATR. Ultimately, what we were able to do, this group was able to identify for them a pharmacodynamic marker, and it was the RAD50 protein, but it was phosphorylated. And in this case, it's at, I believe at serine 635. But that unique marker actually then enabled both of these compounds to move forward in this case, from a phase one to a phase two trial. And this study, to my understanding, is the very first demonstration of now using targeted mass spec proteomics as a way to measure a pharmacodynamic marker for drug development. And quite frankly, I think it highlights the potential of targeted mass spec proteomic assays in a clinical setting to identify new PD markers and quite frankly, measure them accurately. So let me do a little pivot here. So one of the things that took place in my life, and quite frankly, as a first-generation immigrant to America, it was one of the things that I thought could never happen to my career, but it's been one of the most fun and rewarding activities that I've had in a very long time. And that actually took place in 2016, and that's with the United States Cancer Moonshot Program. Of course, at the time, that was led by former, our, our former vice president, uh, Joe Biden, who's now our current president of our country. But what gravitated me to the cancer moonshot was the simplicity and the eloquence of the overarching goals of what it was trying to achieve. Because you have to keep it very simple. 
And and in a nutshell, there's three main aspects that I gravitated towards. One, to accelerate progress in cancer research. And there are many ways that you could argue how to approach that. But the last two are very clear. Can we come up with ways to ensure greater cooperation and collaboration within institutions and among institutions? And lastly, can we galvanize, can we stimulate the community at large as a way of sharing the molecular information from their studies with the rest of the world? So a testament, I think, to CPTEC's collaborative approach when it comes to team science and their implementation of proteogenomics and cancer research is that at the time I was asked by the White House Cancer Moonshot Task Force to begin to explore the development of what we would now call Cancer Moonshot Inspired Initiatives. And there were two of them, two activities that we ultimately launched. One focused on military health and the other one focused on global health. So in military health, the one that we launched is a program that's now referred to as Apollo. And Apollo is, is the acronym of, of a long word, but I'm not gonna describe that, but it's listed on the slide. But this federal partnership involves a collaboration between the National Cancer Institute, the Department of Defense, and the Veterans Administration. And what the Apollo program is doing, a lot of the activity takes place to the DOD, and in turn now they have adopted a lot of the metrics, a lot of the standards of the CPTEC program, and the goal is to implement the proteogenomic-based approach within the military health system. But the other one that was a lot of fun for me and involves multiple countries is this program. It's what's referred to as the International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium. And, the, and ICPC, as it's now affectionately referred to as, Actually, what it does is it galvanizes and encourages collaboration and public data sharing. And that's done through what we now refer to affectionately as a data sharing pledge. And this is done in proteogenomic cancer research among institutions that now begins to represent, which is what I wanted out of this, these institutions in all these countries, it represents the diversity of people in cancers around the world. And this international activity now consists of just over 30 research institutions that spans 14 countries. And there's nice outputs that have come out of this uh, collaboration or, or this effort. So here's just a couple of flagship studies that comes from various countries. One of the first studies that came out was in 2017. It comes from one of our teams in Taiwan that focuses on oral squamous cancer. Just a couple of years later, one of our teams in South Korea put out a manuscript on gastric cancer, which is of high prevalence within their country due to their dietary intake. And a very lovely study came out just two years ago, and that was from our group in China that focused on liver cancer. And in the lung adenocarcinoma study that came from our group in Taiwan last calendar year, of which lung cancer in East Asia is actually unique because it's characterized by a high percentage of never smokers, early onset, with a predominant EGFR mutations. In that instance, the combination of proteomics with genomics was able to distinguish the clinical characteristics of early stage patients with, e with EGFR mutations. Furthermore, new markers for patient stratification and therapeutic intervention were, were revealed when they were conducting their protein network analyses. The other thing that's quite nice about conducting these collaborative activities is that when it came to the lung adenocarcinoma study, one of the notable mentions is that it was actually coordinated an effort between the Taiwan group and the US CPTEC team, which also was studying lung adenocarcinoma at the same time. But to be very clear, because we run our population cohorts in different countries, we have our own distinct patient cohorts. But ultimately, that coordination between these two groups in different countries enabled each team to begin to align their research schedules. Also, intermittently, we were sharing our findings with each other, which eventually then resulted in a simultaneous submission to a journal, which then actually produced back-to-back -back publication in the same issue. And we're very fortunate because as a result, we also landed to cover art within that issue. But within that regard, one of the huge sense of pride that I have is that that prior slide that I indicated that we have 14 countries, 
Well, previously to today, that would have listed 13 countries because it is a great honor to announce that we have a 14th country, and that is Spain. More specifically, one of the newest members to our program is the Josep Carreras Leukemia Research Institute. So just a couple of months ago, under the leadership of, of Manel, and of course with the director of the NCI, Dr. Sharpless, we signed a memorandum of understanding between our two institutions, and we welcome the uh, new institute into the ICPC family. But I would also say, while uh, Manel played a huge role in this, another thank you I have to give to a colleague at the institute, and that is Carolina de la Torre, which was the one who initially approached me. And she said, it will be wonderful if we could be part of this activity. You should learn what we're doing. And indeed, it was one of the great, uh, I think, collaborations now that we've brought on board into the ICPC family. And I'm definitely looking forward to the coming years for a wonderful partnership and a wonderful collaboration in the near term and in the far term future. And if there's any hesitation, I would say, the NCI's commitment when it comes to this direction of precision oncology, specifically combining genomics with proteomics, so two items that I like to bring to note. First, to better understand where the National Cancer Institute sees cancer research now in the next decade, a perspective article was recently published in the journal Cell where colleagues and I, we examine cancer, in this case, through the lens, to be very clear, of molecular characterization of tumors uh, and describe the significant contributions of the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, and CPTAC, both to team science and precision oncology. And quite frankly, what we're doing here is we're making the case that proteogenomics needs to now be fully integrated into clinical trials and patient care. And in addition, this commitment to CPTAC's approach to cancer research is also reflective in NCI's annual plan and budget proposal uh, for fiscal year 2022. So let me leave you with these couple of slides. So one of the reasons that I'm passionate about what I do and the other activity of why I wanted to create the ICPC, this international activity, is for this purpose. And I just want people to think about this. On average, through global statistics, on, 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 on an annual basis, 14 million individuals are told what you never want to hear in your lifetime is that you've been diagnosed with some form of cancer. Furthermore, every year, just over 8 million individuals succumb to its one of its many diseases. Let me make this point once again. 14 million, that is a very large number. And having a family myself that has been part of that number, it is something you never wanna hear. So for me, this is the reason that I wake up every day and hopefully I believe that I'm driven in doing what I do to make a difference in healthcare. Because I think it's about acknowledging scientific approaches that works and if they do not work, how can we as scientists come with ways to make them better. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to give this presentation, and I'll be more than glad to address questions that people may have. So thank you. Thank you, Henry. That, that was great. And it shows really the, the power of proteomics and and the power of international collaboration um, that we will be very happy to to contribute um, uh, here. So it's it's a great it's a great adventure. Hopefully, it will grow in the future. So uh, we're collecting the the pics, the questions here. Remember, you have the chat to send your 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 questions. Uh, let me summarize a, a few of them. Uh, what relates to the um, to the ad advantage of proteomics versus other omics. So, so what do you think that it will be is the main advantage of doing a proteome instead of a transcriptome, for example? <laughs> so, so that's a great question. Let me kind of phrase it a different way. Uh, it's it's like somebody saying you have a daughter and a son. What's the advantage of each? 
<laughs> so as a parent, I will I will phrase it that way. And it, and it has been my approach to be very clear. The part that's interesting about me is that I don't come from a protein background at all. I actually came from a genomics background. I'm a DNA person that, that basically likes developing technologies. So I've always viewed what I learned when I went to school and I learned biochemistry. And if I remember, you had a piece of a DNA, you had an RNA, and you had a protein. I don't think anybody yet is in a position to say which one of these determines clinical care. So as long as a technology is informative to me, my philosophy has been if you trust to measurement, and if the measurement is representative of the biology of that underlying disease, there's an opportunity to bring it in if you yet do not understand the disease itself. So I think both, to be very clear, I think both clearly add value. In fact, I believe running either in isolation is not optimal. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely right. And I'm a firm believer in multiomics too, also. Yeah, it's very important. So, um, more questions. Um, what can be the, the main problem to translate proteomics for clinical use? You know, it's interesting. So, like, that's a good one. Right now, I think it's a couple. Uh, and, and by clinical use, I'm assuming they mean to be deployable in clinical laboratories widely. So, one is uh, throughput. Throughput is still sort of an issue because if you're in a clinical laboratory, clearly throughput is something that you have to do. But quite frankly, I think that could be resolved through automation. Uh, but the other one is still sort of, 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 of a limitation is the amount of material that, that you need. But it's a catch-22, because even though we could do needle biopsy cores today, the question becomes, well, how much of a material are you able to measure? So that's more of a discovery way of thinking. So from a discovery perspective, you yet don't understand the biology, clearly you have an advantage when it comes to nucleic acid, because you can amplify those materials. Those techniques yet don't really exist at the protein level. But once you truly understand from a a uh, clinical marker perspective that this is the analyte you want to look at, those technologies exist. In fact, mass spectrometry that people like to refer to, they say, well, can you use it in a clinic? Can you use it in a clinic? So here's the interesting side. Mass spectrometry has been used in clinics for, 30 la for, for over 30 years. I mean, that's how we measure our metabolites in newborn screening. So it's a technique, and the technique that we use for targeted mass spec is very similar to the technique that's used for the metabolite screening uh, in clinical reference lab. I yeah. think what simply needs to happen is that we need to identify the biology that's gonna offer the value in a clinical setting. Once you can figure that out, then I think that the technology will follow suit. Thank you. Another said, um, in, in all these studies they have shown uh, for proteomic efforts, do they measure the protein level or they can go to the detail to measure post-translational modification of proteins, methylation, yeah. phosphorylation? Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, so like that's a great pro, uh, uh, question. So one, we always believe in uh, quantitative measurements. I know a lot of people talk about qualitative measurements. Well, I could, you know, I could identify 15,000 proteins per sample. I think that's wonderful. But at the same time, because I came from a clinical way of thinking, mine is, okay, well, that's great. But if you had a very sharp lens, quantitatively, what are you looking at? Because in the clinical setting, quantitative values are extremely key. So our measurements are always quantitative. In terms of what we measure, we tend to be very conservative as a program. Uh, we do measure phosphorylated products, and they are quantitatively measured. However, those samples, we are extremely cautious on how they're being collected to ensure that any preclinical analytical variable and the way the material is collected, we could either account for it or we could eliminate it. Mm -hmm. We are starting to measure now beyond the classic phosphorylation. So now we look at ubiquitination, we're starting to look at acetylation, we're starting to look at uh, glycosylated products, but those are more experimental discovery for us but the main one and bread and butter that we go after, because it's one that it relates to the modulations for therapies, are the phosphorylated products. Thank you. 
So um, another question, uh, can you explain a little bit more? You mentioned this in your slide, this cancer imaging, uh, medical pathology uh, effort. So, so what, 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 what was going on there? So, so twofold, what happened, and in fact, that's a good story. Uh, when, we, when the CRF program got launched, because we are collecting specimens from all these sites, one of the things that the National Cancer Institute actually had before we created ours, they were creating a database of images for the public. And they approached me and their question was, so what do you do with all the images that you personally would have access to, which are the H&E stains from the pathology suite and all the DICOM from, from the radiological when you do the follow-up on those individuals or the diagnosis made. And my comment was, I don't know, why? And they said, well, we have a database. Would you like to deposit those images? So for me, the power that I saw out of it was, I mean, think about it. We get a sample from one patient. That sample, what we get back to the world is so well characterized. You get genomic information at the DNA, genomic information at the RNA, protein information at abundance level and at modification. And at the same time from the same individual, you'll get the pathology image and you'll get any radiological image. So we're starting to now mix the imaging data with our molecular information, but it's still very early stage. But I think simply having it and giving it back to the public and if people come up with ways to integrate those worlds, I just think it's opportunities that we could capitalize upon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is very, very interesting. So. Uh, and, and a feel for artificial intelligence. Uh, I remember in the last ACR trying to interpret this um, from the image to deduce the mutational profile, and this is very interesting area. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. AI or machine learning, we're also kind of exploring that space within the program. Yes. Perfect. I have another question here. It says, um, this section here. Uh, Yes. So, um, what is the um, the percentage of solid tumors versus hematological malignancies that have been right now analyzed? You mean so so in, t in terms of liquid biopsies? You mean uh, liquid biopsies and tumor type? So leukemia, leukemia versus uh, oh. more so epithelial? Because I know yeah. TCGA is mostly epithelial. It's not really hematological. Yeah, so so the vast majority of, of, of our tumors are, are all, all cancer types involve solid tumors. That's simply because we wanted to replicate the rich information that came out of the Cancer Genome Atlas. Yeah. So I saw it as, and, and, and the Institute saw it as, well, if TCJ is characterized 33, well, there's your target list, 33, complement that. Uh, the goal moving forward is not just to complement, but are there other ones that we move into? Uh, the leukemia one, it, it, it is a fascinating one that came into our program. And, and that's one that when, when it came in, it's something that we did not think about, but it has turned out to be a very informative sort of a partnership. And in fact, they just, we heard yesterday that one of their studies that I can't discuss was just accepted in cancer cell. And okay. it's one now that begins to show sort of the new information or guidance that you could get uh, when you combine proteomics with genomics. And that is a partnership that is with the BEAT AML program that's out of the Leukemia Lymphoma Foundation. So hopefully that managed group will come online within uh, about eight weeks from now. Yeah, uh, and the, the AML traditional program that you mentioned, that, that's very good. Uh, so, uh, some questions arrived to my door, so I'm trying to, to go through a little bit through this. This is something we discussed before uh, with the speaker. Is the the impact of single cell technology in proteogenomics? Yeah, so so do it's an excellent question, but and then I'll answer it from a very pragmatic uh, way of, of thinking. So because of our characterization arm, that program involves producing data that goes to the public. And the key for us has been to take a material and the key word is comprehensively characterizing that product. So in the current iteration, it was created in 2016. Single cell proteomics yet was not as mature as it is now almost five years later. 
So when we created it, the infrastructure was really not to capitalize on single cell. Now, as the technology has matured, we do have a couple of our studies that are uh, piloting single cell measurements on some of our tumors. Currently, I, uh, you know, there's many technologies that are out there. Uh, they either involve single molecule sequencing, which, 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 which are fascinating from an engineering perspective, but they're limited in scope on what you can do. And yet mass spectrometry seems to have taken a lead here. Currently, you can measure about 3,000. I think you could ID about 3,500 per cell, uh, proteins per cell, and quantitatively about 1,000, about 1,500 to 2,000 per cell. We are piloting a couple of those within our tumors. And what we do is we have disease working groups. So, so, so every time we tackle a new cancer type, we develop a disease working group. And the disease working group uh, determines a lot how we characterize that cancer type. Because the field has progressed extremely fast by the time we could start the cancer type. And if they come back, they say, if you don't do this, you're already behind. <laughs> what the rest of the scientific community is doing, we quickly bring it on board. So we do have a couple that are exploring the single cell space at the moment. Thank, thank you. In the interest of time, I will, I will take the, the last question. It says, uh, many, many pediatric tumors, they have very few mutations, very, very few genomic defects. In those, proteomics can be very relevant. Is there any pediatric uh, tumor effort? Oh, I wish I would have had one more slide. So the only thing I could say is go on Google, search uh, pediatric uh, brain cancer. We just released a manuscript. I believe it came out in December of last calendar year. It was a wonderful collaboration. Uh, so, that, so that involves the Kids First program, investigators from the Children's Hospital of, of Philadelphia. And they were conducting genomics on uh, pediatric brain cancer they approached us and it was just an incredible collaboration. So, and indeed it did uh, because, I mean, the short answer is at the genomic level, you, you would assume that uh, the adult GBM and the pediatric G GBM were identical, but it seems at the protein level, there's different wiring. So it sort of gave a, a clue on a potential alternative therapeutic approach that could potentially now be applied towards the pediatric brain cancer. So that was just published in Cell, I believe in December of last year. So it's something that I could share with others through an email if uh, they like. Okay, so thank you very much. What, what a best way to end this seminar with the good news in, in for pediatric tumors, uh, an area that requires a lot of research for sure. Absolutely. So, yeah, so again, thank you very much, uh, Henry, for your wonderful lecture. Thank you, thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Time.